Hello, everybody. My name is Stephanie. I'm with Senior Advocate, and welcome to our Senior Advocate Lifelong Learning Series. This is a series that we're doing virtually right now with the pandemic, so we're happy to see everyone's faces. I'll be much happier when I get to see everyone in person. I really uh, I miss seeing you guys <clears throat> and, and being able to give out hugs. So um, thank you for joining us. Today, of course, we have the wonderful John Corstein. He's going to be talking about Virginia Canals. Um, we have, after this, we have three more of these classes. We are also doing uh, a series on, it's called All About the Arts. Really, really interesting. If you guys have not joined us for those classes, um, those are on Fridays. It's, it's fascinating. I'm going to be um, posting, hopefully later today, the video that we did on Friday um, and with Ryan. He is an improv actor and we laughed. We had such a good time. So check it out. It might be something that's a little bit outside of maybe what you're used to, but um, I think you'll really enjoy them. So wanted to say a big welcome um, to Howard Hagee. Howard is joining us today um, from the Mariners Museum. He's the president and CEO, and he's just going to say a few words about what they do. Yeah, thanks so much again, Steph. And as I've said each week, uh, you have been really gracious to, uh, to allow the museum to partner with Cali this spring and, and, the, and you know, the wonderful programs that John Corstein uh, presents. Um, it obviously is crazy time. So to have the opportunity to say a word about the museum uh, has just been really gratifying and, and we really are grateful uh, for that. So um, in week one, we talked about the fact that the Mariners Museum was designated by the US Congress as America's National Maritime Museum. And we also spoke uh, on that, that first week about the fact that the Mariners Museum mission is to connect people to the world's waters because through the waters, through our shared maritime heritage, we're connected to one another. Uh, pretty, pretty powerful message for, uh, for today, honestly. Um, and then last week, we talked about the fact that the conservation effort at the Mariners Museum and the USS Monitor Center is home to the world's largest conservation project of its type, the, the conservation of the USS Monitor. And uh, a lot of people don't, don't realize that. And this week, I thought I would share the fact that today, June 2nd is the 90th anniversary of the uh, founding of the museum. The museum was incorporated on June 2nd of 1930. And just briefly, the founding is a, quite a remarkable story. So Archer Huntington is the owner of Newport News Shipbuilding in 1930. And Homer Ferguson is the president of Newport News Shipbuilding. And these guys have got a shipyard full of workers that aren't building any ships because it's the Great Depression. And so uh, Archer Huntington had had this vision for a maritime museum situated next to a shipyard for years, and now is the appropriate time. And so uh, in an effort to keep the shipyard workers employed, and I love to believe that that was a pure act of altruism, but the truth is that it was also a really smart business sense to be able to keep this labor, the skilled labor force together for when the yard would begin a higher level of production brings the entire workforce, or not the entire workforce, but brings the shipyard workers over to the campus where the museum is situated now. They build Lions Bridge, which many of you know is one of the iconic spots on the entire peninsula, uh, to dam Waters Creek and create the 167-acre Lake Maury and put them to work building the uh, museum. So now they've got a campus and they've got a building and not a thing to go in it. So Archer Huntington dispatches buyers all over the world and they're able to purchase objects, maritime objects for the collection at something close to pennies on the dollar uh, because of the Great Depression. And so that story um, really helps us to build an, a collection that is international in scope. Uh, these folks traveled in, all over Europe, uh, South America, Asia, up and down the Eastern seaboard, compiling a collection that situates us absolutely uniquely among maritime museums in the world. And many of you that know maritime museums will know that most of them are focused on the specific geography in which they sit. Think South Street Seaport, New York. Think Mystic Seaport, Connecticut. Uh, we have this, cap this collection that supports our ability to talk about how we're connected uh, internationally, certainly how we're connected nationally, uh, and then obviously connected regionally through the water. 
So it's, uh, it's an important day for us. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful again for being able to share that story. And of course, one of the people that does a phenomenal job of elaborating even more on the leadership of that, um, of that founding story and, and why it ends up being almost baked in the DNA of the Huntington's um, to do something like this is John Corstein. And uh, I can't wait to hear the, the program today. And, and with that step, I'll throw it back over, over to you. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Howard. Um, and I know you haven't really spoke about um, membership opportunities and things like that. I don't know if you just want to take a couple of minutes to tell about your different memberships. Yeah, thanks for that, Stephanie. So if you, um, uh, it, we really depend on our members, as we call them, our, our world of champions. Um, and obviously, um, uh, this year in particular, is a year that we're projecting, you know, pretty substantial reduction in our, in our contributed revenue and our donations. And um, I would really encourage anybody that is, um, that is thinking about um, wanting to support the work of the museum uh, to get on our website. And it's Mariner's Museum, all one word, marinersmuseum.org. And uh, when you get on the site right there on the homepage, you'll see a button at the top that says, uh, click to be a member and, and it'll take you to a page that explains all of the different levels and you can get in um, as a member for a relatively low level of support all the way up through you know whatever you would be comfortable doing. Um, uh, we've been very very fortunate that we've managed through COVID-19 uh, to keep our entire team together and keep the staff paid because we've uh, done a really good job of managing our expenses and understanding the cost structure of the museum. Um, and, uh, uh, but we would be grateful for, for any kind of support that, that anybody um, thought they might want to give. So thanks for, for allowing me the opportunity to say that as well, Steph. Sure, thank you. And for everyone that's on, um, if you go to the bottom of your screen and hover over with your cursor and click on chat, it, over on the right-hand side, you'll see I did type in that website, um, certainly you can type in questions, uh, you know, or maybe wait toward, till towards the end, and then we can take some questions for John. Um, so John, I am on the Dismal Swamp. My background, I changed it just for you. I don't actually know what swamp I'm on. I'm on some swamp, hopefully on a boat. But I thought I'd put on my pearls today and um, get ready for this wonderful presentation. I heard this I want to say it's probably been like four or five years ago. Um, and I thought, hmm, Virginia Canals, all right, let's see what he's got. And you blew me away with it. It was so fascinating. So you guys are in for a real treat today. Um, so we're going to bring on John Corstein, the award-winning historian and book writer. And welcome, John. Thank you very much, Stephanie and Howard. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm not at home. Obviously, why I have such good connectivity. I'm supposed to solve my connectivity issues at home. Plus, you'll notice I have a heavy ear bandage. So my name today is John Van Gogh because I had a bunch of cancer stuff taken away. So you got to start it with a little joke. Well, let me tell you, canals are the link that made America great after the Revolutionary War. And everyone was in a rush to try and connect the East Coast with the uh, center of America or the breadbacks of America or what we call the Ohio River Valley. And the reason why we wanted to do that is <clears throat> that's where all the commerce happened to be. Now, England had developed a canal system prior since uh, around 1720. Uh, there's some other simpler canals that just drain water and so forth. But the canals we want to focus on today are the canals that are uh, designed to help traffic move supplies. I, I think you all remember that uh, in uh, uh, 1794, we had the Whiskey Rebellion. And what was the Whiskey Rebellion all about? Well, they grew corn. The best way to transport the corn was by turning it into some beverage. Um, and then you had to use a mule, and a mule could only carry 250 pounds of weight because you had to go across mountain passes. 
So it was very difficult. And in fact, everyone got so upset that they put a tax on whiskey that we had this minor rebellion that's going to be put down by Light Horse Harry Lee, who we talked about before. So George Washington has this dream of connecting Virginia with the Ohio River Valley. Just remember, as a surveyor, he was out there in 1753, 1752, and 1754. And he recognized that Virginia's rivers all had these fall lines, which you'd have to portage around. So he came up with the concept of three different canals. And the first one he decided to do, and he actually surveyed partially before the Revolutionary War, is what we call now the Dismal Swamp Canal. However, there's a canal that's built before then in Virginia. If you're at the Governor's Palace in Williamsburg, go behind the Governor's Palace and you'll see this ditch. It's all filled in, no water. But the idea was to connect College Creek with Queens Creek using a canal so that you'd have access from the York River and the James River. Actually, that would increase commerce and everything. That was started by um, uh, Earl Murray, uh, also known as Lord Dinwiddie. And he, of course, got chased out of Virginia in 1776. Uh, and so as a result of that, the canal was not built. When the Revolutionary War is over, of course, the United States not only saw the freedom of the 13 colonies, each one of those colonies had Western claims that went all the way to the Mississippi River. And one of the choice things that we start to think about is how do I get to the Ohio River so I can get commerce coming onto the Mississippi? How can I get to the Ohio River so that I can take the raw materials and bring those raw materials back east so they could turn into finished goods and then they can send them back west? So it was a great uh, mercantile system that they wanted to create. And, but there are a lot of pratfalls with this. The canal building age in America was um, brief but it was very dynamic. And the first canal that's going to be built is actually going to be uh, the Dismal Swamp Canal. And in 1784, actually, uh, George Washington will put out subscriptions to raise money for it. They start building it in 1793. Now, why do we want to go through the Dismal Swamp? You know, there's cotton mouths and canebrake rattlers and you know, mosquitoes. Why do we want to do that? Number one, there's a great source of shingles, cypress and cedar shingles, which then were the most popular style of roofing available. So that became a big business. But the real thing is I want to get through Lake Drummond and connect onto the um, uh, Passatank River, because at the Passatank River, that enters into eventually the Albemarle Sound. What does that mean? Well, the eastern North Carolina outside of Wilmington in that section, but we're all along the outer banks um, from the Virginia line all the way down to Beaufort, North Carolina, they did not have deep enough inlets to handle the larger ships that had been constructed to carry goods. And this is a great ship design story because as we built the bigger ships, um, we developed new type of shipbuilding techniques. And so we needed to fill those hulls. And the way we filled those hulls was with the raw material in America. But so, by getting into the Albemarle Sound, you were able to gather all these uh, economic, um, well, agricultural goods, 
uh, building materials, ship stores, turpentine, tar, and all that stuff is in the piney woods down there in North Carolina. So George envisioned that, okay, we're going to be North Carolina's outlet to the sea because the Dismal Swamp Canal goes straight up to where? Norfolk, Virginia. And as a result of that, um, he envisioned Norfolk becoming the major port in America. And he knew it could be. So in 1805, they opened the 22 mile waterway. And I have to say that uh, this is a big connection. Um, and actually, <clears throat> they used it as a tourist site. On the line between North Carolina and Virginia, of course, Lake Drummond saddles that line. And so they built a hotel there as a tourist attraction. I don't know how many people want to go into a swamp with their snakes and mosquitoes, but they did. But the biggest thing about it is that uh, they had a main salon and that was the state line ran right down between it. Gambling is outlawed, trisses are outlawed. So there's all these stories about the sheriff uh, coming from North Carolina, and they just move across the room into Virginia. Likewise, when the Virginia sheriff showed up, well, we just go over to the room in uh, North Carolina. So it became a, a tawdry place of sorts. There are actually several duels there. Um, and because, once again, it straddled that line and dueling was a major thing, there is one tryst. I should have told you this in the scandal. But there was one little uh, tryst that took place between William Fitzhugh and Sally Wales. And she, Sally Randolph Wales, and she, of course, they, she ran away. They show up at the Drummond Hotel. The police from Virginia and, you know, actually her father sends, go get them. And so, woo, we pop over to North Carolina and we get married there and it's too bad. And uh, the two was able to gain part of that inheritance. What a slick guy. And you could do it all in the Dismal Swamp of Canal. But I got to tell you, that is not enough because we're really concerned about building central commerce or commerce centers. And those commerce centers have to be um, here on the Chesapeake Bay. While George Washington is working, uh, and let me tell you, he's got two other canal projects of the Potomac and Ohio Canal, as well as the James River Kanawha Canal. Whoa. Now, what those canals are going to do is connect the Chesapeake Bay, ergo Norfolk, with what? All these raw materials that are out there uh, in the Ohio River Valley. Everyone else catches on to the, um, the uh, Dismal Swamp Canal. And so we prompt a canal to be built in um, 1797, uh, known as the Susquehanna Canal. It's there at Haverty Grace, Maryland. It's like a quarter mile long, but you got around these rapids. And that, that was a big thing in bringing commerce down those rivers. Uh, the next one that's gonna be built is by a Philadelphia and Baltimore uh, businessmen. And it's known as the Chesapeake Delaware Canal. It's still being used for heavy traffic. And as a result of that, it is uh, really a big boom because once again, we're having another way to bring materials into the Chesapeake Bay and use the Chesapeake Bay where we take smaller ships, load the material onto heavier ships and send them to goods where they're needed. Plus receiving those raw materials, sending back the finished materials. Now I have to tell you, George Washington uh, sold stock in several canal companies. And one of them is the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. 
Now you go up beyond Georgetown and especially as you reach towards uh, the Antietam battlefield, you can pick up parts of the original Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. They started it in 1829. Now what's the difficulty in building this canal? you got to bore through granite, right? You're trying to cross a mountain range to get to the Ohio River. And it is too difficult to achieve. And so by 1850, the canal is bankrupt. Uh, you know, when Washington endowed various uh, colleges, and he did two, Washington College in Chestertown, Maryland, and Washington and Lee in Lexington, he gave them canal stock. So I hope they got the right type or sold it before it was wrong. So I got to tell you, um, just going from D.C. to Cumberland, Maryland, which is a rise of 650 feet, required 74 locks and an average of a rise of 8.2 feet per lock. There were 11 aqueducts um, to increase the streams, 20, 240 culverts, um, and uh, they used horses and towpaths to move the canals all the way up. Now, I gotta tell you that uh, this canal is 184.5 miles long. Um, and it was originally based on the company that George Washington founded called the Potomac Company, with a K at the end. Um, and so he wanted to build the canals just skirting what are known as Little Falls, Great Falls, Seneca Falls, and Payne's Falls of the Shenandoah, uh, House Falls near Harper's Ferry. You see what we're reaching towards more agricultural areas. Um, they plan to reach Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but that was 180 miles further to go, and there was just not enough of private capital. In fact, we have debates during the Monroe and uh, administration about having a national road, about having national canals that the federal budget would pay for. And of course, all the people up in New York and other places said, oh no, we don't want money going for a canal that's going to connect Virginia to Pennsylvania. We want our own in our own state. So that's what's going to happen um, with the, uh, um, what we call the Chesapeake, or excuse me, Potomac and Ohio Canal. Now actually in building it, there are all these uh, right-of-way issues. And in 1824, a court case for the right-of-way between, at the point of the rocks, the Baltimore and Ohio Railway, and we, we gotta recognize that these railways are gonna put an end to this canal building time period. But nevertheless, uh, at the point of the rocks, the B&O said, we own that little area there, it's on an island, and, you know, the uh, Potomac uh, Canal said, oh, no, 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 we own it. So there's this big court case. Guess what? The court case supporting the uh, Chesapeake Potomac Canal, or excuse me, the uh, um, Potomac and Ohio Canal, also called the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, they were defended by Daniel Webster. That's how serious this agreement came. And the uh, uh, B&O Railroad was uh, represented by Roger Tawney. And I think you all know about Roger Tawney, brilliant lawyer, of course. He's gonna fight against Daniel Webster, you have to be. But he becomes Supreme Court Justice of the United States and will issue the Dred Scott decision. So let's just say that that decides in the um, behalf of the, uh, believe it or not, the, the, it's a compromise, so the railroad gets part and the canal gets part. They're supposed to share this. Now, I gotta tell you, how do you make canals pay for yourselves? 
with the um, canal going from the Potomac towards the Ohio River. Uh, the fees were a ton per mile. Coal was rated at one fourth cent. Meat was rated at two cents. Spirits, oh my gosh, were rated at four cents. <laughs> and salt was rated at one cent. So, you know, you see this traverse of raw materials, and then on the return, you'd be sending other type of finished goods, which also had a rate schedule. Now, um, that's how you're supposed to make money, but the trouble is the time it takes to build that canal is just far too long, and that causes it to, uh, end up being a failure and they just close it down. Now, Washington had another great idea and I know you've all been to Richmond and you know right there at the Rockets is where the falls of the James River happens to be. And so George Washington set up another company uh, called the James River and Kanawha Canal. Now, he started it he, he surveyed it, believe it or not, in 1785, right? What else is he going to do? Back on his plantation, no longer a general. We, he's not needed to create the Constitutional Convention. So he surveys this himself. And then he says that, well, we can connect the Ohio River Valley with Virginia ports to make Virginia an economic power horse. We have access to uh, the Eastern Continental Divide. I don't know how many of y'all driven through uh, uh, Virginia, uh, West Virginia, but to get to the Kanawha River at Huntington, West Virginia is ever so difficult, I have to say. And so um, they ba basically are able to reach all the way from Richmond uh, to uh, Lynchburg, also all the way to Lexington, Virginia. But the money runs out, and they reached that by 1851. Now, why uh, the, uh, um, actually, Virginia sets up what is known as a Board of Public Works. Um, they opened the first seven miles in 1790. Um, it was the first commercial canal, or considered commercial canal, in the United States. It was 196.5 miles in length, and it opened in 1840. And guess who was there at the opening? William Henry Harrison, uh, the great hero of Tippecanoe, son of the signer of the Erie Canal. But I want you to realize these dates when these canals that are trying to reach through the mountains to the Ohio are, are actually coming. And they're all after the rise of different systems. Number one, to compete with um, canals, guess what they come up with? We're gonna build plank roads. And the most famous plank road, uh, two most famous in Virginia, Orange Plank Road, and then also the Jer Jerusalem Plank Road. And these things actually were just what it sounds like. Uh, they put logs and they put planks on top of them and you got charged per mile. If you were a walking person, it was a quarter cents a mile. If you were on a horse, it was half a cents a mile. If you were in a carriage, it was a whole cents a mile, you know? So you, that's how they were trying to gather tolls and everything. The plank roads are a huge failure. Now, Washington also planned what he thought was an important canal, which is known as the Cape Cod Canal, because he wanted to join Cape Cod Bay um, with Buzzards Bay, traversing the neck of Cape Cod. Um, but that was a great idea. It only had to be 17.5 miles. But by that time, you didn't need it for commerce. So it was built by the Corps of Engineers, 17.5 miles, and it was, um, I've been through it myself, and uh, um, it's mostly for, uh, you know, sports, uh, sports sailing, and so forth. The real canal we got to worry about, though, is the Erie Canal. 
member pieces. People are rushing to try to get to where all this commerce is. Now, the Erie Canal is going to be the brainchild of Governor Clinton, and he noticed that when you go all the way up the Hudson to Troy, there comes in the Mohawk River. And that if you traverse the Mohawk River across the Seneca Lake, and then you reach on another river that takes you, guess where? To the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are even better than uh, than getting to the Ohio because there's even greater resources that are there. Now, everyone thought he was a joke. And as a result of that, um, he will uh, uh, still push forward. Uh, the uh, Governor DeWitt Clinton um, will use state bonds, which is a big, terrible vote. We're using state money to build what we call Clinton's ditch. Well, Clinton's ditch, when it's done, I have to tell you, is going to be amazing because uh, they have this ceremony in New York City where they drop waters right from Lake Erie into New York Harbor, and then they go down the canal and they dump New York Harbor money in or not money, water, uh, into Lake Erie. This is significant. It is the only canal that is going to effectively do what they wanted it to do, link the great, what we call uh, Ohio River Valley and the Great Lakes with a major port. Notice with the building of the Erie Canal, New York is not the leading port in America at that time. Actually, at one moment, it was Philadelphia, but Philadelphia had all these yellow fever epidemics. So then, actually, Norfolk was rising in importance uh, because it was a deep water harbor and had, connect, had all these connections throughout the bay. But once the Erie Canal is finished, um, Norfolk is no longer to maintain a leadership, and New York becomes the commercial center of America. All because we have foreign goods that we can take out there, raw goods we can bring, send those back. The same old story. It was an, an economic powerhouse until what? Well, you have to realize the Baltimore and Ohio Railway goes all the way to the Kanawha River. And so the railroads that the boom begins in 1824 will actually supersede. They're easier to build, uh, they're faster to build, they're more efficient, more effective. And so that ends the rise of canals in America. But it was all started here in Virginia. Um, you know, uh, someone woke up one day and actually his name is Marshall Parks and said, why do we have to go through the Dismal Swamp Canal? Uh, because, you know, the sound reaches all the way up and we can connect 14 mile ditch that takes us to the eastern branch of the um, Elizabeth River. And that creates the Chesapeake and Albemarle Canal, which today the Dismal Swamp is still used. You have to have more shallow of a vessel. Uh, but the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal is a very, uh, Chesapeake, excuse me, and Albemarle Canal is very critical. I have been through every canal from here or from actually Savannah, all the way up to Quebec. Uh, so I've been on the Erie Canal, St. Lawrence Seaway Canal, the Alligator River Canal. I mean, it's amazing how we figured out how to have protected waters for our commerce and connect America with itself. So that's my story about canals in Virginia. Um, 
And I think I went a little over, that's okay. Um, who has some questions? Yes, you can go ahead and type in your questions under the chat. Um, I have a question for you, John. Oh so gosh. what is your favorite canal and why? <laughs> well, I'd like to say uh, the Dismal Swamp Canal because George built the first really working canal in America. And I like George and uh, I like North Carolina, I like Virginia. So it was actually a, a, a great concept. He just couldn't take it any further than that. So I think the one of the more enjoyable to do is actually the Erie Canal because they have uh, enough locks so that at first you're excited when you're going through a lock and then all of a sudden you don't care because it's the same old thing. Um, but you do get to see great landscape. Uh, St. Lawrence Seaway, however, is the most impressive because it's built in the 1950s, remember? And so it can handle, uh, how do you like to be on a little cruise boat you know, that handles 80 people? And next to you is a big, big freighter that's 400 feet in length. You don't feel so good, do you? You know, and you're rising up at the same time. Uh, it's, uh, it was pretty amazing. I like the St. Lawrence Seaway. I've been through the Cape Cod Canal, and if you're taking a nap, you can miss it. <laughs> you know, that's pretty funny. The Alligator River one, however, is not very well used, but it connects up to uh, the uh, uh, Chesapeake in a uh, Albemarle Canal gives a cut through uh, the shallow part of, I think that would be um, Pamlico Sound. And the, no one's there. The wildlife is unbelievable um, because it's nothing, I mean, you see some boats run up the side left to rot. Uh, it's a very scenic, I can't tell you, we couldn't count enough bald eagles, ospreys, hawks, other birds, saw some alligators, and uh, so and not much traffic. So it's a nice cruise if you're on a sailboat or even a powerboat. Um, at, at the end of that canal, right at the way you enter the Chesapeake and Albemarle Canal, it's a little town called Conjac. Has everyone heard of con coin jock? Aha. Well, the funniest thing is, as you're going through these canals, they have little advertisements. The best prime rib in America. And, you know, I was with these passengers. We were being fed well anyway. And, and I said, well, that can't be true. And so we, we anchored there for the night to get gas or fuel and everything. We went there and, oh my gosh, it was amazing, one of the best prime ribs I ever had. But, you know, so I don't think you could go wrong taking an intercoastal waterway cruise, whether with your family or on a cruise boat. Um, it is fascinating because you really have a leisurely way because you can only go about 12 knots in some of these canals. So it's a leisurely way to see the topography of America and how it changes, to see how we strove to make our nation connected by superior transportation systems. How's that? Excellent. The Thank canals you. provided the most effective economic return for Virginia. Well, maybe the James River and Kanawha Canal, um, it's built so late that the railroads were already a heavy, the Virginia Central Railroad had already been built, actually tracing the same route that later becomes the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. So uh, I think the one that really had the most bangs for its bucks is going to be the Chesapeake and Albemarle because they don't build a railroad into Eastern Virginia, that part of Eastern Virginia, um, until the late 1880s. So that's the way you got your goods from um, 
North Carolina up to the port of Norfolk and vice versa. I like the Great Dismal Swamp Canal the best just because of its connection uh, with um, George Washington and the foresight he saw the need to connect the East Coast with its ports to the hinterland of America with all of those raw materials in an effective transportation system. Just remember, before you have these canals, you'll find that a pack horse, remember I told you 240 pounds, uh, or a pack mule, how long does that take to move? Where does it go per hour? Well, probably about two miles per hour. So now all of a sudden you realize the, the, the problem with commerce at the time. Um, and so I would say the best one for economics in Virginia would be the Chesapeake and Albemarle Canal. How's that? Great. And we've got, it looks like another question. Um, was it Lord Dunmore who envisioned the canal connecting College Creek and Queens Creek? Was it ever yes. completed? Yes. Um, Earl, um, Mur er, um, Lord Dunmore, also known as James Murray, uh, was governor of Virginia. And actually, you can still see parts of the traces of that canal, particularly if you go to the, um, go to the, uh, um, go at the governor's palace and look behind it and you can see it and uh, a great idea because you didn't need any locks you just had to dig a deep canal you know because the peninsula i guess you all live in the peninsula or in norfolk but the peninsula actually has a ridge i know it's hard to see in hampton uh, but there is this ridge which is its fall line all the rivers on one side flow into the York River, Chesapeake Bay, Hampton Roads. All the rivers on the other side flow into the James River, including College Creek. And so that was the concept. Um, uh, so um, it, it would have helped Williamsburg grow as a commercial center <coughs> excuse me, not just a political center. But, you know, when Lord Dunmore got chased out of the colony, I don't think he's going to work on it anymore. So, you know, that's that. <laughs> so any other question? What is the story on the Kempsville Canal system? Ah, glad you asked. Trying to use the Indian River to connect to the Lynnhaven River, which will take you right out to Lynnhaven Roads. And so by getting to the Lynnhaven, this canal, you can still see traces of it, especially when you're going out and like you cross Indian River Road and a couple other spots. It was a failed project though, because it was too expensive and by the time it really got going, it was superseded by the Chesapeake and Albemarle Canal. Um, that was well backed by brilliant engineer Marshall Parks, who also owned the Hygieia Hotel on uh, Fort Monroe. So he was um, uh, pretty effective, but the Kempsville Canal really never lived up to its promise. Anything else? We got another one that was emailed to me, a question. Um, they were questioning the extensive smuggling that was done on the Dismal Swamp Canal by the Confederates during the Civil War, even though the, I guess it was controlled by federal forces. They wanted to know if you could just comment oh, on that. Let me tell you, <laughs> this, this, this is really good because when Ben Butler becomes commander of the Department of Virginia, Eastern Virginia and North Carolina, he knows that down in North Carolina, you got tobacco, you got cotton, you got all these other goods. And that he knew through his brother, Andrew, and they did this in New Orleans as well. So Andrew, uh, Andrew Butler was the official uh, cotton agent for the United States. So one bale of cotton for the Butler family and two bales for the United States. That's kind of how it worked. In this case, um, and every time uh, they weren't raiding plantations, 
they actually were trading medicines, uh, other cloth, other material that was desperately needed in the South uh, for those items that, you know, um, Butler could buy cotton at two cents a pound U.S. and sell it for 10 cents a pound in New York City. So, you know, that's the illicit trade. And it came really through because the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal is a very open canal, a large canal. And yet the Dismal Swamp Canal, you had many ways to get the material there. You could sneak through there. You could eventually get out uh, to uh, probably Great Bridge is where they had the transfer point from Confederates. And these were not formal Confederates. These were Carolinians and Virginians who supported the South. So all the goods they traded the cotton for, they then provided or sold to the Confederacy. Uh, so uh, it was, uh, but I can't say I've seen any record of, of weapons making that trip, but mostly critical medical supplies, blankets, shoes. Um, you know, uh, it takes a lot to put an army in the field. So you think of everything other than the gun and the cannons, that's what you got through that trade. Okay, I think last question uh, that was emailed to me, they wanted to know about the role the Dismal Swamp played during World War II when German submarines threatened shipping along the Atlantic coast. Well, the intercoastal waterway, um, uh, the Dismal Swamp Canal did not play a major role as much. Although the U.S. Navy actually had a uh, workshop, so did the Co Coast Guard, in what's known as Elizabeth City. Uh, actually, they took a Civil War uh, ironclad called the Amphidite, and they turned it into a machine shop. Can you imagine that in uh, Elizabeth City, where the Patasquank River uh, uh, really has its main port? So uh, the Chesapeake and Alamar Canal enabled smaller coastal schooners, coastal um, freighters, especially the, my favorite was the NBC line, Norfolk, Baltimore, and Carolina. And so they actually are bringing goods back and forth um, the same way you would have because if you're going to try to go outside of Virginia Beach, you're into a danger zone, as we all know. And um, so numerous ships were sunk off of the Outer Banks. So that's why uh, Elizabeth City, uh, Fort Macon at Beaufort, North Carolina, became major bases uh, for submarine patrol. But uh, the ships had gotten so big especially tankers, by the time of World War II that you couldn't use that intercoastal waterway. Now it's mostly used by barges, commercial barges, and, um, you know, uh, um, who is it? recreational uh, use. So, uh, uh, in fact, I was on the Alligator River Canal. I know that's real exciting, uh, but we saw one barge and the whole time we were going down, and one commercial barge, every other ship we saw, and I've been down that canal about eight times. You know, I, until this year, uh, for the past several years, I've worked as a lecturer on a cruise boat, believe it or not. <laughs> you know, what a scam. Oh, no, it was, what hard work. <laughs> uh, but it was amazing, just, and that, that barge, when it came down, I just, you know, everyone said, what? And so it was a fuel barge. So, um, you know, um, so that's, that's my story. The canals I could spend five hours on because really we should look at it. There are different canals also. Richmond has the Tredegar Canal, which actually brings water down through a runway. So they work the water wheels of 
you know, the Tredegar Iron Works. Same thing happened uh, to uh, what we call Shaco Slip. They diverted the James River and Kanawha Canal in slipways that would actually bring water down through the mills. And so, you know, believe it or not, in 1860, the largest grouping of flour mills in America was where? Richmond, Virginia. Partially because of how well the James River and Kanawha Canal reached into the breadbasket called the Confederacy, the Shenandoah Valley. So it never got to its full purpose, but still uh, um, it, um, so there's drainage canals, there's power canals, there are shipping canals, um, and the first canal really is Metheth in uh, Nantucket Island just so you could get through this one marsh and uh, to form a pond. It was kind of simple, but from then became the great um, canal spirit. You can get a lot of different groups to go down the Erie Canal, uh, just like the uh, St. Lawrence Canal. So it is a very wonderful experience. So if you haven't done it, I tell you, I'd do it. Well, <laughs> I'd do it again, let's put it that way. Okay, any other questions? I think that's it for questions, John. Thank you. We wish you um, quick recovery from your uh, your ear and yeah. uh, your. I kind of like being John uh, <laughs> Van Gogh. You know, this may work as a joke for a couple of days, but <laughs> I have to have this taken off, and then I have to have another operation. So uh, I don't know how much of my ear is going to be left. So I shouldn't joke about it, but that's okay. Um, it's, I, I was, I don't know if you all know, but I was a lifeguard for seven summers when I was in college and graduate school on Fort Monroe. And, you know, I had the greatest 10 going. I drove a convertible back then. So, you know, like I thought I was groovy. Well, now I'm paying that price. <laughs> so anyway, you all take care. I'm so glad you're with us today. And uh, I look forward to next week where we will um, explore some more history. I forget, what's my topic next week? I know, let's see. Uh, next week we are doing the victory at Yorktown. <gasps> oh, what a fabulous story. <laughs> and, oh, you know, I should have five hours to do that one, but I'll try to make it good and sweet uh, because it is where our nation was founded. So until then, I just want you all to remember to sink before surrender. Thank you. Thank you, John. I am going to just real quick, I'm gonna change the view. Um, so, uh, you were recording this, but I just wanted to change the view so we could all see everyone who's on. I know a few people have their videos turned off. Just wave and say hi, everybody. It's great to see y'all. Um, if you would like to sign up for other classes, you can go to senioradvocate.live. Um, you can always call us as well, 757-724-7001. Thanks again, everyone. John, great job as usual, and we'll look forward to seeing you all next week. Take care. Bye-bye.